I am so pleased to be joined by Ken Williams. Ken is a pastor at Bethel Church in Redding, California, and the co-founder of the Change Movement, which is a Christian organization that is based in, in California and works with people who are seeking to leave the LGBTQ plus lifestyle, uh, who are struggling with same-sex attraction. Ken is also the author of the new book, The Journey Out, How I Followed Jesus Away from Gay. Ken, thank you so much for being here. Oh, such an honor. Thank you, Virginia. So you were on the podcast with us about two years ago, uh, and you shared a little bit of your own journey, your struggle with same-sex same, same sex attraction as a young person. Uh, you've now written a book telling your story, The Journey Out. So just share with us a little bit uh, of your story, just to review as a refresher, uh, and what you experienced as a child and as a teen that, uh, that really led to you, you know, thinking, okay, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with these, these same-sex attractions, and mm -hmm. um, then kind of what that journey out was. Sure, thanks. In my experience, uh, typically the formation of homosexual desires is multifactorial. And so that was the case with me. And, you know, looking back on what happened in my life, that's very clear. So I was the scrawny guy. So I didn't fit in with the other guys just naturally. You know, boys are trying to exert their power and climb the thing the fastest or knock it over or whatever, and I was smaller. So I had a, a struggle there. I also believe I was wired, you know, called really to be a pastor from mm -hmm. birth. I think God's, you know, gifts and callings are, are like that. And so um, I wanted to talk deeply. Well, seven-year-olds don't, you know, boys don't want to talk deeply. So I, I fit better with the girls in just in that demeanor. Um, as And also, um, and maybe most significantly, I was exposed to hardcore gay pornography just mm -hmm. while playing with a few other boys in a field. Mm -hmm. One of the guys opened up a boot box that was just out there, and, and what I witnessed caused me to lose respect for males. Mm -hmm. Because obviously I wouldn't describe what I saw, but it's different than you, it's worse than you would expect. Yeah. And, and it really um, dishonor and degradation is what I witnessed. And so I lost a lot of respect for males at that point. And I, I was already struggling because they mocked me and I was having trouble keeping up. Um, in addition to that, then those boys um, having witnessed that along with me, um, a couple of them initiated um, some touching and things like that. They were doing what they saw in those, um, in those magazines. Mm -hmm. And so um, now I, you know, I'm dealing with shame at a very deep level because I had no intention. I believe I had just recently gotten, I got saved at eight years old as well. Uh -huh. And so I'm in a real dramatic moment in life because I'm, I'm in love with Jesus. I really wanted to follow him and please him and all of that. And yet something entered my life I never expected. And you're just a little kid. You have no Absolutely. ability to process No this. one has ever talked to me about yeah. pornography. I didn't even know what that was until it was shown to me. Wow. So my life just took a turn at that point. And um, now I, I, I really just pushed masculinity away because it seemed wrong. It mm -hmm. didn't seem godly or noble to me. And the problem is I was male. Yeah. <laughs> so when you push masculinity away, I pushed me away. Consequently, I was constantly looking for me in another male. And so, you know, there are different um, expressions of homosexuality or struggle. Um, mine was largely codependent, you know, and, and so that search for finding me in someone else had gotten sexualized because my first sexualization was at the hands of only males. Yeah. So uh, the problem is, you know, it's impossible to find me in someone else, mm -hmm. you know, and that now, to me, that needs to be God revealing who I, who he created me to be. And so instead of trying to find it really in him, I was trying to find it in these other guys. And, and so at 17 years old, um, I'm suicidal because I'm just really empty inside, mm -hmm. felt very lonely, felt like nobody knew me. And really they didn't yeah. because I was making sure nobody really knew me. Yeah. Yeah. And you talk in the book about you kind of reached this this breaking point where it was yes. like, all right, someone has to know. And you sat down, you kind of wrote out everything that was going on in, mm -hmm. in your heart, in your mind, and you showed it to your youth pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then his response was. <laughs> he's like, he's like, well, well, Ken, you're not gay. Yeah. And I was like, OK, that feels good. And at the same time time what do I do though yeah you know um, because I'm pretty sure that was pretty clear on those nine pages that that's part of my struggle so he said well we're gonna get you 
uh, we're going to tell your parents. And mm-hmm. I said, oh, no, no, <laughs> we're not going to do that because you didn't. This is the 1980s. You don't yeah. tell anybody this. Yeah. Um, I didn't know a single person who was gay. Any, I had never heard a single comment about homosexuality that wasn't dramatic. Wow. That wasn't, wow, that's the worst thing. Mm. And so no way did I feel safe to share that, even with my parents who I knew loved me. Fortunately, we did it that, that evening and they cried with me. The way I remember it, a couple of hours, we just kind of wept and shared and, and all that. So it was a wonderful, I mean, my, my life began at that moment. Wow. I mean, because I, I felt like several years ago, the Lord showed me that the only way you'll ever experience unconditional, well, you'll never know unconditional love until you first shared your condition. Hmm. That so many people, particularly in the LGBTQ experience, are trapped in that life for decades because they've never felt a safe place to actually share it all. Yeah. And as we know from Scripture, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. Yeah. Yeah. So I I wasn't experiencing unconditional love because nobody knew my condition. Mm-hmm. Once I shared my condition. I was able to receive the love that my parents had for me that I didn't know that they had to that level. Yeah. So then what was the journey from that point at age 17 to today? You're married, you Mm -hmm. have kids. Mm -hmm. So, you know, was it an instant? All right. You know, from the time you had that conversation now, you know, the same sex attraction is gone or was it a long, long journey? Uh, Mine, you know, I don't believe it has to always be as long as my journey was. There weren't many resources back then. Yeah. Uh, I, I wrote the journey out book. Uh, you know, the journey out dot me for anybody looking for it. I wrote that to be the book that I couldn't find wow. because I, you know, um, I didn't tell this part, but I had gone into the Christian bookstore, you know, just before I wrote my, the letter to my pastor looking for a resource and there were none. Mm-hmm. So my first moment of having suicidal feelings was when I was walking out of the Christian bookstore. Mm-hmm. So I wrote the book to be that answer. Um, And what was the question that you just asked me? (laughs) Well, just uh, because now you're married and you have kids. So what was kind of that journey to get to that point where I, you know, I do have attraction for women? Yes. Well, yeah. So it was a journey and um, it began with um, just being hooked up to a counselor. Hmm. That was the first thing that my parents said. They're like, well, you know, what what are you wanting? I said, well, I, I, I don't want this. It's just I've prayed a thousand times and I've tried to change the way I feel, but I, I can't, you know. Yeah. And so I started seeing a Christian uh, counselor and I was I was a minor. I was 17 years old and um, I was no longer suicidal after I had shared with my parents and then had a counselor who I could tell absolutely anything to. And I wasn't going to be rejected. I was a safe place yeah. for me to process and um, just walked with him for five years weekly. Mm. Um, that was the a beginning. And I, I just learned about God's grace. I learned about, yeah, okay, so you've got you've got some sin, you've got some struggle, but God loves you, Ken. I was like, wow, I just that was just foreign for me. Mm-hmm. It was I was I was really very legalistic in my understanding of God and and so that was very vital. And then really I had an experience where a, I, I had had a five year illness and a friend um, said, Well, Ken, God doesn't want you to be sick. And I, again, I was like, What? You know? But he said, no, God doesn't want you to be sick. You know, there's there's healing all throughout the Bible, even physical healing. He he laid hands on me, prayed, and I had a, a real, it's a longer story. I had a total encounter with God. All of the pain left. And for the first time in five years, I was pain free. And, um, and so I no longer had that illness. And that was so dramatic for me that I, I realized, oh, my goodness, God is good. Like he didn't want me to be sick. So... If that's true, and if God had given directives in Scripture about sexuality, and if he had said that homosexuality is not condoned, it's it's considered sin, then he must have a solution for it. Because he's not crazy, he's good. He's not diabolical. So if he says something's wrong, surely he has a solution. And so I went on a journey of finding more of him. Like how how much can he be known and what will he offer for me? Mm You know, Psalm 103 is my favorite passage of Scripture. It's like, you know, um, uh, forget not all his benefits, who heals all your diseases, redeems your life from destruction, all these things. And so I went after that. And he showed, I mean, you know, it didn't happen overnight, like you said, but it did happen to where, you know, um, I got, I then went to a ministry school for three years. And my, I I would say I experienced the transforming uh, by the renewing of my mind. Mm. 
because I, I realized how many lies I had, I had believed. So just because I had an experience, you know, and, and I was touched inappropriately and that catalyzed things didn't mean that was who I was, right? That didn't, that didn't mean that was the deepest and truest version of me. I merely, a, a pathway in my brain was opened up because of what happened to me. Yeah. And so I was able to um, just go deep with the Lord and by seeing more of who he was, start to find who I was. Yeah, yeah. We are talking with Ken Williams, author of The Journey Out, How I Followed Jesus Away from Gay. So, Ken, um, share a little bit about now Mm -hmm. you co-lead the change movement. Mm -hmm. You journey with individuals who are really kind of walking through the same thing that you did. Mm -hmm. How how exactly did that come about to where you said, okay, this is actually um, my my ministry in a way that I want to journey with people Mm -hmm. who are living this like I did? Yeah. Um, I had been um, part of the leadership of a men's purity group at my church. So this is starting probably 12 years ago or 13 years ago. And so found so much fulfillment in that. because I've been married to my wife now for 15 years. We have four kids. And, um, and so, boy, you know, when, when God does something in your own life, it just feels really good to help other people who are where you used to be. And um, and so I was able to do that in that young adult, in that uh, sorry in that men's ministry, and started to just realize, wow, I have passion here. Mm-hmm. Wow, I have a sense of destiny when I'm able to, you know, probably every eight weeks or so, I would be the featured speaker that week um, in that group, and I would just come alive, and I would realize, oh my goodness, there are so many people out there that don't know what I know and and really need that encouragement. So I started there, and then I ended up meeting um, Elizabeth Wanning, another guest on your um, podcast, and um, we started comparing notes, Uh, another friend of ours as well, and we would just weekly, we would have coffee and talk about what has God done for us, how did we find this version of ourselves and come out of an LGBTQ experience, and and started ministering together. Um, And then in 2018, when California tried to pass a therapy ban, um, that would have really shut down. It would have made my book illegal. It would have shut down all the help that I got from my therapist. I mean, that was just like a non, there was no way we weren't going to stand up against that bill because they, they, that bill would have cost people their lives. There would have mm-hmm. been people ending their lives like I almost did, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. they couldn't find hope. And it shut down the gospel, yeah. you know, when, when <laughs> it, it would have made illegal uh, allowing people to walk in the direction that God has called us to walk. And so um, as we started speaking out against that legislation, uh, it went viral on social media and people saw, wow, there are a bunch of people. You know, we had 30 people standing on the Capitol steps in Sacramento sharing their testimonies and picked up by the, the news and all that. And so now we have, you know, thousands of people traveling along together in a closed Facebook group, for example. Um, that have the same experience. Wow, that's so powerful. And legislatively, where do things kind of stand right now? Obviously, in society, we're seeing an increase of just conversations about LGBTQ and gender mm-hmm. identity. Uh, what are kind of some of the pieces of legislation that you all are, are watching? And mm-hmm. um, I know you've been in D.C. this week talking with legislatures. What mm-hmm. are you focused on? Um, very much on the Equality Act um, and Fairness for All. You know, those are just really, um, you know, they have sweet names, but um, when you look deeper than that, they're, they're very harmful, um, very um, controlling. You know, the, it's really the government stepping in and controlling people's sexuality. Um, you know, and, and I understand that the effort is to provide protections for LGBTQ identified people. And I'm all in favor of them being treated with the dignity that every person deserves. You know, nobody should be discriminated against or treated unfairly. Um, I think we're seeing in culture right now that actually um, an LGBTQ identified person is is on the verge here of maybe having even more liberties than some of the rest of us. I mean, certainly more than I do, to be quite frank. Mm-hmm. Um, we are um, we are villain. You know, we be we are cast as villains. Quite, quite often because we're countercultural, and that obviously is not our heart. But, um, you know, I, I'm, una- I'm unable to accept a worldview that says that if someone has experienced confusion of their sexuality or has had a moment of homosexual desire, that that's who they are, because I know that that's not true. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I know the fulfillment that I and so many of my friends have experienced 
by, uh, you know, as I talk about in the book, surrendering wholeheartedly, you know, wholesale, you know, to to what God has called us to live, and and how to, um, what the kind confines are for our sexuality, and then finding the peace that came with that, yeah, the joy, the feeling of connection and bonding with God that I wasn't able to experience when I still had my own plan for my sexuality in my back pocket that I could dip into if I was wanting to medicate myself, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, the equality act fairness for all are, are, I mean, they, they restrict rights of conscience, um, could potentially take away some freedoms of speech. They definitely interfere with my practice of my religion. Um, and, and it's, the, it's literally the government stepping in and say, these are the options for your sexuality. If you ha- have had this experience mm-hmm. forces doctors, to uh, it would it would uh, create a scenario where doctors could be forced to violate their own conscience in giving treatment to people um, that let's say were requesting a, uh, a you know an attempt to change their sex and uh, would disallow them from being able to say no I don't believe I you know I c- do no harm I, I can't I can't offer you this so th- that's one of the major ones there are ones that are also um, you know trans uh, focused on the transgender situation that. That would be very, uh, very harmful. Um, it's it's time for Christians to stand up, lovingly, and say no. You know, to to put the right people into office, to vote, to um, to go show up at their school boards, and say, well, you know what? If you're going to be implementing um, queer theory into the curriculum, if you're going to do comprehensive sex ed, that's going to suggest to my uh, elementary school students, maybe even in kindergarten, that maybe this boy is a girl, then w- this is time for us to not only push back against that with the school board, but it's time to stand up and say, okay, I want my medical doctor to be able to come in and talk about what does biology say about human sexuality. You know, I want I want an opportunity to talk about what it means to be a confident and healthy man of uh, a man and a confident and healthy female. Mm-hmm. You know, those types of things. That's 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 what's on my heart today it's like it's it's going to take pushing back with legislation but also just a grassroots um no i'm going to make a stand for christian morality yeah and as you're doing that as you're sharing your story as you're seeing others share their story through the change movement do you feel like you're being heard do you feel like you know lawmakers are like okay yeah i'm i'm hearing what you're saying Mm -hmm. i'm paying attention um yeah do you do you feel a positive momentum forward I do. I do. We have a long way to go. Yeah. I'll be candid. We, we do have a long way to go. There are a lot of voices out there and major media is, is shutting down our, our voices. Um, when, I, when I post something on Facebook that is anything related to this issue, I have four likes and you know, two years ago I had 200. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I'm, I'm being censored and, and my friends as well. Our books canceled off of, fortunately my book is not canceled. It's out there on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and things, but um, most of my friends' books are. So, you know, there are, um, there are forces that we have to reckon with, but I am very encouraged that Washington has begun to listen to us. We're able to, um, to start being known by some different legislative offices and um, different groups in D.C. and then in different states that are starting to realize, wow, if we don't kind of um, uh, stand up now and if we don't start um, looking out for the welfare of people rather than just towing the the line of woke culture, we're going to lose a lot and there's going to be a lot of people um, left in in the wake that are damaged. Yeah, yeah. Well, the book, The Journey Out, as you mentioned, it's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Um, Share a little bit just about uh, who this book is for. Mm -hmm. Uh, This book, I, I wrote it up in the beginning of dedicating it, like this book is for those that want a way out you know i'm not trying to this book is you buy it if you want it if i'm not speaking to the people that are content with an lgbtq life but there's so many that are not fulfilled with that doesn't scratch the itch and so for those that it's like oh this feels impossible i don't know you know i feel disconnected from god over it i'm telling you it does not have to be that way you know, I can't promise exactly what your future looks like, but I know that God says that, I mean, he, he does exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or imagine. That's his words, not mine. And, and he, you know, all things are possible to them that believe is in the Bible. And so, you know, when we come to the Lord and lay down everything, like I talk about in the surrender chapter, it's amazing what he can do 
with our lives and how he can um, show us a version of ourselves, uh, like the real, the deepest version of ourselves that we've lived however many decades and we're completely unaware of when we really meet him in the places, like I point out in the book, where he's wanting to meet with us. Yeah. Well, I love uh, both that you share your story in the book, but then I feel like you just offer some really practical tools, mm-hmm. you know, talking about vulnerability, talking about mm-hmm. surrender, mm-hmm. that encouragement that change is possible. Yeah. Uh, why did you decide to kind of craft craft it the way that you did? Um, well, it, I, I felt like I needed that. Yeah. I, I didn't. That's what I was always looking for. Like, oh, well, you just got to follow the Lord or you just got to hear God. I'm like, well, how do I do all that? You know, I, I really needed um, kind of to be handheld a bit in my discipleship. And so I, I broke it down in the way that I thankfully eventually was able to experience it. And, um, you know, I, I put practical things in there like, you know, what do you do when you're how, how do you uh, remove triggers from your life that are unnecessary? Mm-hmm. Because it's amazing how the enemy can convince, you know, um, can convince us that we are something. Like he's, he's a liar, right? I mean, we can see from the, from the Garden of Eden in the very beginning that he was, the enemy was whispering into Adam and Eve's ears and, and lying to them about, you know, who they were and what he was and what was to, to be their future or yeah. what they needed and all that. And so, you know, we need practicals about how we can um, understand what the lying voice is and how we can um, kind of help ourselves. You yeah. know, how, how do we how do we remove the things from our lives that we're not ready to navigate right now? Mm-hmm. And how do we more, probably more importantly, how do we add into our daily lives the things that are going to be um, necessary? Because so many again, so many people try to do this on their own. They're not, they don't invite their community in, into it because they haven't felt safe to. But then, I mean, you know, we get picked off. But the, if the, the enemy's strategy so often is to isolate us. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, you know, we're not very strong alone. But boy, when, we're, when we have a community that we can build around ourselves intentionally, you know, um, there are a lot of great people out there that God has yeah. that can be a support to us. And, and so I put that kind of practical wisdom into the book. I love that. So good. Mm-hmm. And for those who are thinking, I really want to get connected with the change movement, how can mm-hmm. they do that? Yeah. Um, you can uh, follow along with us on Instagram. Just look for Changed Movement. Um, or on Facebook, we have a public page by that name as well, and then also a private group, and you can uh, you can up- request to join that group as well. Great, awesome. Well, again, for all of our listeners, uh, the book is "The Journey Out: How I Follow Jesus Away from Gay." You can get it at Barnes and Noble, Amazon. Ken, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks, Virginia.